quick recovery, he probably will not be here tonight, okay? So um, myself and Gilbert, we've done this years and years together before, okay? I've done this talk before, so you're going to see a little bit of a different. You got some pinch hitters here, all right? So that's what we're going to have tonight. However, you've got his book. For those who are familiar with it, his book will be available to those. He's written a book of his own experiences with the Holy Spirit, okay? And, and um, we'll have, we provide a copy of that to, uh, to each family, each household tonight. You know, you'll be getting one of those copies, and uh, it'll be something you have to read. It's not like the book you have now is you read every night. This isn't required reading. It's just something you may want to just peruse because it reads in many cases, like Acts of the Apostles, okay? Different events in his life that, uh, that I, well, after I give the talk, it'll be a lot easier to explain, okay? I'll come back to it after the talk is over, okay? So, um, very, uh, the summary of the talk very simply is um, the Apostles before Pentecost and then after Pentecost, and then us, before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, after the Life in the Spirit seminar for most of us. Um, we're going to give testimonies, basically, to the workings of God in our life. The Holy Spirit was a key piece in salvation history, okay, for us. Um, Jesus addressed a number of problems that Adam and Eve had set up, okay? They had set up a problem where they had made uh, Satan the prince of this world, okay? They had set up a situation where they were going to be separated from God for all eternity, okay? The source of life. This is pretty serious, okay? Um, it's more than just friendship, so to speak, all right? You're going to be without connecting to life. Okay, and, and, and a, like a continual death, eternal, that's what we would make, what they, how they refer to hell, hell is, um, what do they say? I forgot that. I'll think of it sometime. All right. But it's um, the opposite of, of eternal life, kind of eternal separation, eternal death. All right. Um, and also, we were left with a thing called concupiscence, okay? Before we at least related to God, now we are afraid of him, okay? We were kind of afraid of each other, as Rick described last time, too. Something changed in us that, that really changed our ability to do what's right and wrong. We became selfish. Um, we became fearful. We became, I guess, selfish is the best way to put it, okay? That, that in a summary, puts it in. Me first, I, I need to be God. Okay, and God can't be God. I want what I want. Okay, we were luck, stuck in that situation. Now, Jesus came, in summary, okay, and something special happened, okay? Um, he came by virtue of, uh, of the fiat, Mary's yes, okay? God's plan was for Jesus uh, the second person, the Word of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, to become a man, okay? To become Jesus Christ, all right? But it took the yes of, of Mary for that to happen. This was proposed at the Annunciation by the angel Gabriel. That he described God's plan, and she said, I don't know man. And ironically enough, this is where the Holy Spirit begins in this. The Holy Spirit... He said, will come upon you, and the child you will conceive you know, will, be, will be Jesus, Joshua, okay? God is with you, all right? Um, Emmanuel. She said yes. Jesus continually says yes through his life. And turning down the devil at, in, the, in, the, in the garden and other places. Um, Mary the same way. They did what Adam and Eve didn't. Adam and Eve made the mistake. They say, no, it's got to be our way. God said to do this, we're going to do something else. They did exactly the will of the Father to the very end. At the very end, Jesus was on the cross. Even then, Satan threw the crowd with saying, come down from that cross. Don't die for their sins. He stayed there. 
okay? And so it was finished. He said that his last words, it is finished. And through rising from the dead, he brings us into the possibility of eternal life. We accept it. Okay. It was the yes of Jesus and Mary, okay, Oh, undoing the first act of Adam and Eve. All right. Therefore, now God is now <laughs> back to being the prince of this world, not Satan. Adam and Eve chose Satan. They liked his ideas. Now, now, G now Jesus is, is the prince of this world. Okay. And he was going to send the Holy Spirit to us for two particular purposes. One is to help us to undo that, that inclination to sin, the concupiscence, okay, that we all feel. We know it. We know it's still there. But he wanted to take things that seem impossible for us to do and give us the power to do things that seem impossible, to resist certain sins, to be able to do that. And he's going to give us that power to do that. Okay? A lot of us, even to this day, operate on our own power. Okay, we operate on our own power. We think we can do this. If we try hard enough, we can make it happen. Well, nope, it isn't going to quite work that way. There's certain things we just can't do. And it's for the Holy Spirit to, to give us the power to do this. So he, he came purposefully to deliver his spirit to us. He follows the model that happened for him, okay? We had the Holy Spirit with Mary, and then he goes, after 30 years of life, to the River Jordan, where John is baptizing, okay? And he goes to get baptized, okay? At this time, they called John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, all right? And so John sees him. John had been saying, there he is, the Lamb of God, the pure Lamb, as Rick described it, the, that lamb had to be pure for the sacrifice. There he is, the lamb of God. And then Jesus comes in to get baptized, okay, which confuses John completely. He says, wait a minute, we got this backwards here. You should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. And, and Jesus just said, okay, for the sake of all righteousness, just go along with this now. There's a reason for it being this way. He gets baptized, okay. The Holy Spirit falls down upon him, okay, and he's now empowered by God to take on his mission. And God the Father, talk about a, a, a Trinity moment, speaks out, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So he gets baptized, the Spirit comes, and he's ready to take his mission. Okay. Jesus continues on through his mission, and then just before he dies, he tells the apostles, I gotta leave you now. I've got, I have this bad, this baptism of pain I need to go through, how I wish it were done, but that's for the, but what am I gonna do? He asked the Father to take this away. It's for that very purpose I came. I have to do this. He wrestled with that in the garden. He eventually conquered the temptation, okay? Went to his death. But he said, don't worry about me going. If I don't go, you won't get the Holy Spirit like I got the Holy Spirit. You're going to need to have this Holy Spirit to carry out the mission. Okay? He rises from the dead. It's 40 days after his resurrection. They're on Mount Olivet, I believe. And they're asking him, now, now, Lord, you're finally going to set up the, the kingdom. You know, we, we see you, how you broke through this. You defy the, the Roman army. They try to kill you, but now you're still alive. Now we're really ready to go. Let's have at it now. Okay. Well, he just said, just wait. <laughs> didn't even address what they said. He just didn't address it. He just said, just wait. I want you to go back and wait till the Holy Spirit comes. And then all power will be upon you and be ready to go. Okay, up until that point in time, they were, even to this point, even that last confession at that time saying, let's, let's, get, this, let's get this earthly kingdom going here, shows they still didn't get it yet at that very late hour. 
They still didn't have it. Okay. But when the Holy Spirit comes, something changes. Okay, and something changed in them. Before this, they were afraid. They were still in that barred up upper room there, shivering, waiting for this to come, not knowing when the Roman people are going to come and get them, praying in Novena, waiting, as the Lord said, for the Holy Spirit to come. And then the Holy Spirit came. Kevin will describe it. This is a reading from the second chapter of Acts. When Pentecost Day came round, they had all met together, when suddenly there came from heaven a sound as of a violent wind, which filled the entire house in which they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. These separated and came to rest on the head of each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak different languages as the Spirit gave them power to express themselves. Now there were devout men living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, they all assembled. And each one was bewildered to hear these men speaking in his own language. They were amazed and astonished. Surely, they said, all these men speaking are Galileans. How does it happen that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, residents of Rome, Jews and proselytes alike, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them preaching in our own language about the marvels of God. Everyone was amazed and perplexed. They asked one another what it all meant. Some, however, laughed it off. They've been drinking too much new wine, they said. Then Peter stood up with the 11 and addressed them in a loud voice. Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, make no mistake about this, but listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you imagine, why it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what the prophet was saying. In the last days, the Lord declares, I shall pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young people shall see visions. Your old people dream dreams. Even on the slaves, men and women, shall I pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the sky above and signs on the earth below. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes that great and terrible day, and all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Last thing first. Peter, his description to describe to the people out there, okay, now squares with what Jesus' plan was. Okay, he got it. It wasn't like a big second kingdom, a formation of a new army, an earthly kingdom. It wasn't that at all. Okay, he was aware that the Holy Spirit was coming. Something changed him. It allowed him to speak out loud to numbers of people. He was bold at times. He was bold in the garden, okay? And when he thought Jesus was going to roused up an army, he got his sword out, and he cut off someone's, someone's ear. Jesus healed that, that Malchus, I guess his name, uh, his ear. But when he, when he followed Jesus along, John got him into the inner court of Caiaphas' house or wherever they were uh, dealing with Jesus at the time. Um, he quickly lost his, he lost his nerve. Um, quickly, okay? At that point, he was 
cursing and renouncing Jesus, saying, I never knew the man. Okay? Even in his face, and Jesus spied him and saw him, and he, their eyes met, okay? And that's when, when he broke into tears. Um, so he, he clearly didn't have the strength he needed to be able to face a difficult situation. Now he's in basically a neutral crowd. There's lots of people out there because what took place? They said all of a sudden this, this noise like a big wind came along, okay? And they could hear it in the building, but apparently they heard it in the neighborhood as well. Okay, as I pointed out last week, Rick, that your model of Jerusalem and, um, and Caiaphas' house was just down the block a ways from where that Pentecost took place. So my guess is for 3,000 people, it should have been enough of an overflow that the people could have, that the high priest and company would have seen it from their house, okay, and try to uh, take action. But this was like 9 o'clock in the morning, as, as Peter said. But something took place. Tongues of fire came on them, and they began to speak out in another sound, okay, a sound that was familiar to the folks that were there. They could each hear the, the apostles praying, in their own language. They heard their own language when they were praying out in whatever um, angelic an uh, language was given them. We made, re made reference to his praying in tongues. And what they were praying was the great deeds of God. It was praise. It was saying things like, how great are your works, O Lord, that you have done great things. You parted the Red Sea. You rose from the dead. They're proclaiming all the great things that God, God did, okay, building the faith of the people out there and building their own faith. So you had several things going on at that point, was that the apostles are being affected, they're speaking out in a language they never heard of before, not even knowing for sure what they're saying, and then you got these other people hearing, knowing exactly what's going on. And it's that communication from them back to the apostles that tell and make the confirmation there is a miracle going on right now. Something unusual is really happening. So, as they begin to question what is happening, they're saying one, one person came up with a, I guess, simplistic solution. They must be drunk. Okay, a nice way to just put a name on it and be done with it, not being able to really understand it. And that's how we get away with things that we don't can't deal with. We just put a name on it and then we can't, and maybe that allows us to own it in some respects. But that's what they did. Peter takes that opportunity, goes up and speaks and tells them. And tells them, no, that's not so. Okay, and explains the miraculous nature of what took place. As you see later on, they are convicted by this. And, and he asks, what can we do? We'll tell you about that at the end of this talk. Okay, at the end of this day. But prior to that, they saw these things happening. Okay. They saw these miracles, and they were quick. They, something took place with it. Now, one of the aspects of, um, of what Jesus is doing by the power of the Holy Spirit is this. As Rick had mentioned, the way we can appropriate what Jesus did on the cross for us to regain our, sal our salvation, regain our place in heaven, is to believe in Jesus. So he has given us the task of what? To tell the people about this. He said, at Ascension Thursday, wait till the Holy Spirit comes and you shall be my witnesses. You're going to tell them just what I've done. Okay, nothing more, nothing less. Not some big arm, arm wrestling with, with theology or whatever and facts. None of that. It's not that at all. It's just saying, this is what I saw the Lord do. This is what he's done for me. Now this speaks to those 3,000 people. And it says in that day, that many were converted to the faith. Okay, that's quite a number. What happens is, is that God touches people with a miracle. And what we sing about is the experience they experience. 
Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle in them the fire of your love. That's what happened to them. It's one thing when you experience a miracle or something good happening to you. Or say, I have a nice word to say to you, okay? And it encourages you. And you take courage from it. That's nice, okay. Okay, Ken said something nice to me. But if something happened to you, where all of a sudden you knew, that wasn't from Ken. That was from God. Only God could know this. Something happens inside of you that fills you with the fire of his love. Something sets you on fire, okay? It changes you. It makes you want to follow God even more. So even for those of us who have been converted, have a deepening conversion when, when God touches us in such a way that we know he's personally interested in us. Forget about everybody else. He's personally, and he really is there. He really knows me. And then, as I see myself through his eyes, I begin to know myself better. I begin to even appreciate myself more. So he wants to anoint you with a kind of a charismatic power, okay, that will create miracles, sometimes with a small, lowercase m, not something that's going to be proven by scientific proof, but by something that's going to touch a person's heart in such a way that they know it's real. They know it's real. And I feel it and I'm changed. It was a song we used to sing early in the renewal days back 40, 50 years ago. It, was, it tip, typified what happened. Was, the name of the song was, I Heard the Lord Call My Name. No sweeter sound than hearing the Lord call you by name. You know that, and it touches you in a deep place. And he wants everyone in this room to experience that, okay? Sometime during their lifetime. They haven't yet to experience that, to hear the Lord speak to you, and to hear him call your name, okay? And that's going to give you such energy to want to proclaim the gospel yourself, to say, you know what? This is what he did for me. You can have this too. That's witnessing. That's witnessing. He's going to empower you to do that, okay? Now he has another plan in mind for the Holy Spirit, and that's to address this thing called concupiscence, all right? That tendency in us that, like fear, like selfishness, like bitterness, like envy, various kinds of, of things in us that don't reflect God and his love. And these are things that have a hold on us. And it's really hard for us to beat, okay? So with the Holy Spirit in us, what happens is, is he begins to set up situations in us that begin to allow us to be obedient to God in, in certain situations that allow us to grow through situations. For example, to love your enemies, okay? It's hard enough to love your friends, okay, the way they can treat you, all right? let alone love your enemy, all right? So, you get the opportunity to have to love enemies. And sometimes it's hard, but he inspires you to do something which you just cringe in wanting to do, but then you do it. And he empowers you to do this, okay? And then it's hard, but you get through it. But you're now you're stronger. And there's another situation, another. You keep saying yes to the Holy Spirit, and then he just goes in. And next thing you know, what seemed to be impossible became possible. What seemed to be just possible became very manageable. What becomes manageable becomes almost effortless, so we're doing it without even thinking. He transforms us into holy people. He wants to make us and remake us in the image and likeness of God. He wants to empower us to be holy like God is holy. He's not saying, you got to do this on your own. Come on, get with it. He's going to say, I'm going to give you the power to make this happen. Okay? 
The gifts and miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit are there for the sake of evangelization and bringing the gospel to others. If you look at Acts of the Apostles, it makes this note several times. It says, okay, signs and wonders accompany the preaching of the gospel. You'll see that, you'll hear that, because this is the time of year you hear lots from Acts. Let that be a buzzword. You'll hear that in Mass sometimes. Signs and wonders. When they started to talk about God, talk about Jesus and the gospel, okay, signs and wonders, miracles seem to occur following them. And it's said to confirm their message to those folks. So they're hearing things about God, okay? They're hearing things about the gospel and, and, and Jesus' love, and then they're seeing different things happening to them in such a way that show, yeah, what they're telling me about Jesus is really true. God is really there, okay, and he wants to change us. And he's going to do it. So those things, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, peace, joy, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, humility, these are the kinds of things, um, well, Rick Warren used to call it family resemblance. This is what Jesus, those characteristics are characteristics of Jesus. He wants you to look that way too. Okay, family resemblance. And you will. With time, he's going to do that to you and for you. So those are the basic things that he wants to do and why he wants to do them. You can see things change with them. They were... They lived an unselfish life. They sold a lot of their property to make sure the needs of others were taken. They communed with one another, and they just enjoyed a life together. All right? They, didn't, they certainly had their difficulties and their problems along with it. Sin still existed, but they were now empowered to overcome that sin. And they witnessed to Jesus. They told others about Jesus, and more and more came to want to know more about Jesus himself, to include even Pharisees, the very people that killed Jesus want to know more about him now. So that's what happened. Something happened so dramatic that here it is 2,000 years later that we're experiencing the fruits of what took place that day. Okay? We are that. And that still said he wants that fruit of that to happen with us as well. Okay. Gilbert and I were... Whoops. Excuse me. You know, they had to pray healing over me. Okay? <laughs> um... The, um, uh, we're going to talk about the kinds of things that took place with us after the coming of the Holy Spirit in our lives and certain changes that took place in us. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So why don't you hook them up? conversation together. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, we met way back in the beginning. Gilbert came along. He just was out of the Navy. He was a shy guy, but he had remarkable characteristics that were just impressive, you know, as he gave himself to the Lord. So is there any stories that you want to share about the changes you've seen about yourself? Well, Owens was kind of religious. I had an experience when I was a child that uh, brought me to a belief in Jesus and uh, um, where I felt that I made a personal commitment then. So I kind of grew up believing and trying to live a Christian life, but I wasn't doing too good on the effectiveness of, of, of um, holiness, let's put it that way. Um, I didn't understand anything about the Holy Spirit. I don't know what happened. I went through all the same Catholic teachings, but the understanding of the Holy Spirit uh, just kind of eluded me. Uh, so um, uh, I wound up not being able to really live a Christian life perfectly. I'm still, I was still good in a lot of ways, but. Uh, uh, I, needed, I needed something more, and I could feel that I needed something more growing up. And uh, 
and I, I think God was trying to reach me. There was a couple situations, uh, like when I was in the CCD classes at St. Margaret's mm -hmm. years ago, and uh, uh, there was other people in there. We were all the real shy people. And, uh, and one day, this one individual came in, and he was so excited. He had just been on a retreat, and he was very outgoing. He was excited, and, uh, and he just came to me and says, it's all about the Holy Spirit. Mm. That's what he said. And then he took off, and he's going to tell other people. Uh, and I didn't, and I didn't, didn't <laughs> I mean, that was a shock. But I, I remember uh, on Pentecost, uh, praying, to, praying to God to teach me about the Holy Spirit. So God was going to answer that prayer, but he's going to wait nine years before he does it. And that's, uh, I don't know why. So um, that's when I first uh, met somebody who told me about the Life and Spirit Seminar. And uh, it was uh, at, a, at a wedding. And I thought the, the, the reason why I was, went to the wedding uh, it was kind of miraculous as it was. I didn't know the people other than the, the daughter who was getting married. She was a family friend. Uh, but uh, I didn't go to the, the wedding. I sat, stayed out in the um, parking lot while my mother went into the, the wedding. And I'm looking around the parking lot, and I'm looking, seeing all these cars with Jesus bumper stickers all over them. And I didn't really think, I said, that's a Protestant thing. How's it? doing this here in the Catholic Church. Ah, she must be marrying a, a Protestant. Well, anyhow, at the reception, I didn't skip that. <laughs> uh, but it was good. That was, I, I saw my neighbor, uh, a next door neighbor, uh, in the apartment complex that I uh, uh, lived in. And we didn't really know each other too much, but I saw her there. So we met at the mailboxes one time after that, and I asked her, you know, if she was uh, related to uh, the, the the groom. And she said no, and she started telling me about this prayer group that that meets at uh, St. Margaret's, and she was telling me about how God works miracles and uh, and healed uh, so and so's knees, and and then she started telling me we're going to start a uh, Life in the Spirit seminar uh, soon, uh, mm. and I invite you to come. She was very bold. She she was open, and she told me all about the prayer meeting, and uh, the, she didn't tell me a whole lot about the seminar, but she invited me to come. So, uh, and since I, at that particular time in my life, so I grew up believing, and I can tell you, I've seen God answer my prayers and work uh, miracles in my life, including a healing. Uh, but yet, there was just this something missing thing in me. So I guess God was just waiting uh, a little more. So I went to the prayer meeting, and uh, and it was kind of different, you know, a lot of praise and worship and all that, and. You know, but it didn't bother me too much because in, <laughs> in my searching for for God, I would visit some Pentecostal meetings. If you, you know, and I sit there and I say, well, this is just like Pentecostal meetings, only a little more peaceful. <laughs> 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 so that's that's so. You know, I, I stopped going to the Pentecostal meetings. I, said, I didn't need that. Just you know, I, was, I never quit the, the church, though. I continued to go to church. But now this was something that I could add in. Uh, and eventually, then, when the seminar came about, I took the seminar. And uh, did you have any more questions before I sure. go? Sure. Um, well, maybe. Um, I mean, I could tell. But Gilbert was, was interesting at that time. We eventually, probably in two years, we. We moved in together. We had three other guys uh, that moved in. We called it a men's household. We got together and we prayed in the morning and we were all part of 
what was New Life Community at the time. And one of the things that was interesting about Gilbert was how he knew his Bible. He was living with four other guys. All of us had master's degrees, okay? And we were from uh, Catholic places. A lot of us had 12, 16, more years of Catholic education. He had, Bert, did you have much, you went to CCD, you said, so that was something that you got, mm -hmm. okay? But I'll tell you what, when he would share his insights about what the scripture was reading, it was incredible to behold. He just really knew his Bible. Not that he had much of it, but you could see the Holy Spirit working in him. Mm -hmm. Even now, we'll ask him, Go, but where is that in the Bible? He can just, just and we're getting mm -hmm. older now. We can't quite do it that mm -hmm. way. It takes a couple of snaps. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but, but he was just, he's able to just get in there mm -hmm. and, and get the, and, and find it. And, um, uh, and, and not only that, his insights in particular, the wisdom he has mm -hmm. about what's there. Some of you were here about time as a man here. He came in and he said, he gave his own description of what happened to him. And he said, he, he worked in this theory, he started opening the Bible, and finally he said, it just popped out at him, okay? Mm -hmm. I got a, got a kick out of that because it reminded me of Gilbert and a number of us, Mary Beth, okay, a number of people that had that experience. We know what it's like to all of a sudden be able to say, hey, we really get this. We really understand it. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense to us, okay? And Gilbert's one of them because there's no education to back that up to say he's got all this book learning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, okay? He just reads it and gets incredible insights mm -hmm. about what God wants to say through that passage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been remarkable to see him do that and uh, in his doing that. Um, he's a very gentle soul, a very loving person, mm -hmm. very unselfish. The fruit of the Spirit was always in him all the time. He was always giving things away all the time. He has almost nothing to speak of, but he's always giving things away, looking for ways to help people, giving of his time all the time, watching kids. He was great watching children and children's ministry when, in, our, in the younger days. He just did that marvelously. And, uh, and he had a heart for God. He, um, I'll let him share a couple of stories, but he was responsible for bringing a lot of people to to know the Lord. The very thing that the Lord wants us to do is to be witnesses, share people, and get them to come to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. That is each one of our mission as being a baptized Christians. That is what we're all supposed to do. He had that heart all the time. He had it like it was effortless for him. He doesn't even think about doing it. It just happens with him. Mm -hmm. But he brought his mom and dad. Those are the hardest people to bring. Your family are the hardest people you can get to bring people to the Lord. They have built-in um, walls against you, all right? They love you, don't get me wrong, they love you greatly, but they've got this big thing to resist them because they know you, and, they, and, and for whatever reason, they do better with the stranger. And so often, you better yield to that and just pray for a designated stranger to come meet your friend, okay, mm -hmm. your, meet your relative. But he brought, and so why don't you share about your dad and your mom? Okay. That came after I went through the seminar and was prayed with for the baptism of the Spirit. So uh, that made a bigger difference even in my life more. That empty feeling went away. And I was, had a lot of concern for my uh, parents at that time. I don't, there didn't seem to be the concern there beforehand. Surely I'll go to heaven. Uh, but anyhow... Uh, I had that concern for them now, and uh, and I began talking to them about uh, you know my experiences with the prayer group and all of this and what I've learned, and uh, they listened and uh, there was some some problems. Well, my father was not a baptized Christian. Uh, uh, his his mother died when he was like uh, 11 years old, and. Uh, he went wild, and uh, so he never got baptized or anything. And uh, my mother, well, she got kind of excommunicated because she married my father. <laughs> so, uh, and she stopped going to church. She raised us all in the church, all right? There was no doubt about that. And they let us do that, but she stopped going to church after all the kids have grown up and um, that didn't set well with me. 
Um, so uh, I would vi visit them and I would try to talk to them a little bit. And I know Guy was doing different things in conjunction with what I was trying to do. Um, uh, my mother had some Baptist friends who were talking to her about God and, and everything. On one visit that, this is, well, I might as well just get to it. I went to visit them one Monday night and we were talking and it was getting late and it was time for me to go. And so I got up and before I got to the door, I think I felt the Lord prompt me to say, invite her to go to midnight mass with you on Christmas Eve. So I turned around. I, I felt that was from the Lord. So I, I told her that. And uh, she, she was like, yeah, I think I would like that. Because she had been in church for some years. And, uh, and we went to church on that, that uh, Christmas Eve. St. Margaret's, Father Peterson was there. And it was kind of ordinary for me. And I didn't see any emotion from my mother. And we went outside the door. And all of a sudden she says, I feel like I'm walking on air. That was the best mass I've ever seen. Yeah. That was the best sermon I ever heard. That's what she said. I was being shocked because she didn't show no emotion. And she said, I'm going to come back to church from now on. And she did for the next, that was back in 76 or 77. And she, she uh, well, she died in 2019. And I guess before she got real ill, she, she never hardly missed a mass since then. And uh, uh, she reconciled with the church and everything with, through the, uh, other situations that I could talk about, but uh, you know, I'll just leave it there right now. I'm confident where she's with the Lord now. But my father was a different story. Uh, not being a, well, he had some Christian influence with his family. His sisters grew up in the Baptist church and uh, they, they would, uh, you know, preach at him now and then. Well, he would run off. Uh, well, anyhow, uh, he he would get all all I could do was say is, uh, and he would get up early on Sunday mornings. And back in those days, the only thing on TV on Sunday mornings was one preacher after another. <laughs> okay, and none of them were Catholic. <laughs> all right. And anyhow, he was, pre uh, he was listening to them and, uh, for years. And um, he did give up drinking, he gave up smoking, and uh, uh, things like that. And I could see those things happening in his life. And, uh, and then he was, when he got sick and uh, congestive heart failure, and, uh, and, my, and by the way, my mother was now kind of, evangelizing him a lot more over the years since she'd come back. And uh, uh, while in the hospital for one of his uh, problems, uh, he said to me, I've had a bad attitude all my life. And, uh, and he said, uh, and I forget exactly what else he said, but I, you know, I said, well, we talk, talk about, do you want to be baptized? And he said, yes, I need that. So the water cup was there, and I baptized him. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was, I was sure that it, would, it was a good baptism. And he was smiling after that. And, uh, and he was happy because my mother started telling him, says, unless you get baptized, You'll never see those pearly gates. <laughs> and I guess that kind of laid a little heavy on him. So he wanted to be baptized. And, I, and of course, um, uh, she wasn't really sure if I could have done that. It was real baptism or anything like that. 
but I was walking towards the church the next day. That was a Saturday, and this was a, a Sunday. And I walked in towards the church, and I seen that my walk and the priest from the priest's house were going to intersect. And so uh, we did. We said good morning to each other and everything like that. And I said, I baptized my father last night. <laughs> <laughs> and then I explained the, t the, the situation. And, uh, uh, and he just, I'll, I'll, go, I'll come to the hospital and I'll give him confirmation. And uh, he did. He came to the hospital that, that, that day and, uh, and he talked with my father and then he anointed me and uh, he granted him confirmation. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was about a month later that he died. And, um, and of course, he died a Catholic, baptized, confirmed Catholic. And uh, I'm not a big believer in signs too much, although I've started seeing signs, wonders. Uh, as I was driving, me and my mother were driving home after the, uh, he died. Uh, uh, we were, there was one of these, uh, you know, one, this is a sunny day, and one of these big rainstorms that just came while it was sunny. And uh, I looked over towards our house, and I saw a rainbow over the house. And I said, well, you know, I put my own message into it. I said, well, the, the rainbow, like the days of Noah, stood for the baptism of the earth. And it looked to me like God was accepting my father's baptism, letting me know that he accepted his baptism. And on the day of the funeral, a dove, not a white dove, but a dove uh, <laughs> landed on the roof of his house and uh, sat there all day long. So, gee, signs of baptism and confirmation. You know, I was very grateful to God for that. Um, you know, I, you know, things like that. Uh, so, I was happy. You know, for both my parents. I also tried evangelizing my sister and my brothers and things like that. And, well, it turned out to, it was best that I prayed for them every night. And, uh, and I can say, let's see, we got it. These two conversions and uh, the guys and my sisters came to the Lord uh, also, working on the others. <laughs> <laughs> Praying for them. Uh, so, uh, family was, it's important, uh, you know, to me that my family uh, be saved. And uh, uh, let's see. Okay. Any other questions or, or is this enough? <laughs> um, Gilbert's truly a man of God. He really is. Okay. Everyone that meets him will say that. Okay, he's got a giving heart. He's always doing for other people. He's put aside his life to take care of his mom. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's done many sacrificial things. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you right off the bat, he's not perfect. You know, certain things will cause him to lose his temper on occasion too. We should, he's a quiet mm -hmm. man, but he always comes back. He's always quick to repent and get it straight, get mm -hmm. to confession. He just does that. Mm -hmm. But his heart's for the Lord. So he experienced these things that all of us hopefully should experience as well in our lives mm -hmm. in a way that our, 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 the general motion is, is you realize once you're baptized, all right, that your mission now is to get other people into the kingdom of God. Jesus paid an incredible price to get us so all of us can spend all eternity with him as mm -hmm. opposed to just spending in desolation in eternal death, the second death, as it's called. That's mm -hmm. the word I was looking for before. Okay, you don't want that. Okay, you want them, everyone, to be with the Lord. And so mm -hmm. he's given us the mission to just pass that on.
Mm -hmm. And he, there's failures along the way. There's lots of them, but he's experienced a lot of good ones mm -hmm. as well. And it's been, he's been a blessing to all of us. He's got mm -hmm. an incredible servant's heart and a great mm -hmm. sense of humor and uh, quiet. But when he speaks, he speaks. Mm -hmm. he, he really has some good things to say. And so, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's Gilbert. Uh, but to give a quick synopsis of my own differences myself. I came to the Lord at Notre Dame in college, and it was at going to daily mass. Chances are I went into mass trying to follow some attractive girls there that seemed to be going to church. <laughs> okay. But I met the Lord instead because I heard a sermon that just caught my ear. And instead of going and being aware of, of people uh, of being, uh, uh, having a mechanical kind of attitude toward the Lord, in a way, or toward God, I began to understand and, and, and get a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was afraid of God the Father, so sort of afraid of Jesus. I wanted to go to heaven, wanted to be near Mary, okay? But I'm not so sure I wanted to be near God. I thought, man, <laughs> if he gets his eyes on me, out I go. All right. So, uh, but now, late in my 20s, it began, began a relationship with Jesus. All of a sudden, I discovered him. He became very personal to me, and I wanted to give my life to him. All of a sudden, life made sense. It made all the sense in the world. And I wanted to give myself to him. Didn't feel led to be a priest or something of that nature, but I felt I needed to take on his mission. Whatever his mission was, I wanted to do. At Notre Dame, it seemed to me the attitude was more toward taking on and, and caring for the poor seemed to be the thing, or even social action type things were the thing that seemed to be the thing that grabbed me immediately. So I left Notre Dame. I got some exposure to charismatic stuff there, okay, but I didn't buy into it at the time. Went to, came here to Bel Air and started my ministry, so to speak, and trying to help people out. And, and I just eventually just ran out of wind. I just got into almost a deep depression okay, over it. Uh, things just didn't seem to work out. And it really wasn't until uh, God turned me toward the Holy Spirit, okay? And I started coming to prayer meeting at St. Margaret. This is 1973. But even after the Life in the Spirit seminar, and I, I, they had me teach one because I was a young guy and I could talk, you know, some, I couldn't talk out well. I wasn't a good speaker at all at the time. But I was young and, and there was a person to speak. And I did a horrible job at the Life in the Spirit <laughs> seminar. It was the worst Life in the Spirit seminar. I can own that one, okay, <laughs> uh, ever given at, at that basement down there. And, um, but something happened a little bit later on, okay, and it, it happened back at Notre Dame. I went to a 1974 conference there in the Holy Spirit. The people wanted me to come, so I went there. And something very powerful happened in the Holy Spirit. It was a charismatic conference and just a number of things, I'm not going to go into detail with it, that took place that I just felt God was saying, this is what was needed to happen. The reason I was burnt out was that I was doing, trying to do social work, but it was outside the power of God in doing it. I wasn't doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, just my own wisdom, all right? And worse yet, my strategies were horrible. Okay, my help for trying to help people, I, uh, I, the strategies that were there were primarily just ending, ending up enabling the folks to stay in their situation. It didn't bring out the gifts that, that God has under their tree that are supposed to come out and, and help other people. No, they were meant to kept on the farm, so to speak, and I just saw the ineffectiveness of that. My ineffectiveness and the ineffectiveness of the kind of social work that was being done. It just, just, it just uh, imprisoned people more than it helped people. And so I just saw a sin abounding. The only place I saw something different was when I'm back on that campus. And I met hippies and the like, the ones that wouldn't believe in Catholic teaching at all. Completely converted, okay? They believed in humane vitae and things that were the more difficult teachings of the church at the time. And I said, something really changed them the very thing I wanted to see happen with poor people that I couldn't make happen was happening with these folks, these hippies. They were, they were still hippies, but they loved Jesus, okay? And they were really 
in submission to him and his church. And I said, this is where it's at. And so something changed for me. And I said, and the Lord just told me at that conference, this is where he, you're to go. This is where you're supposed to spend your life. But it wasn't until two months later at a prayer meeting, I, there was a guy I was uh, rooming with at the time. This was like 1974, 75. He was a captain. He went to Georgia Tech. And uh, he was really given to the Lord in a deeper way than I was. And um, we, were in, we were actually uh, doing some good works. We were taking some, um, um, went to Stella Maris and um, Villa, I forgot what the name of the place was at the time. But we, they, they had a lot of um, kids there that we would just take out to just do something, to be, adopt them for the day, so to speak. So we went out and did that for a day once and then it was a day that I know was the uh, Lamb of God prayer meeting that night. I knew they didn't want to go, but because he was so, such a good guy, I said, come on, let's go to the prayer meeting. Okay, because I'd never been to that prayer meeting ever. Something happened at that prayer meeting that just grabbed hold of me. Something changed, and all of a sudden there was a fire in my belly. Okay, I was on fire for God. The fire of his love came on me. Mm -hmm. Now I had no difficulty speaking about the Lord to people. I had a strategy, I knew it was to happen, and I could speak about it. I was excited about God, okay? I was even actually leading a, a, a folk group. Kevin and I were in a folk group at the time, and something changed that I could do this. It would be very easy for me to, even though I had a terrible voice, I wasn't a very good guitar player either, but I had no problem just doing it, okay? Just doing it, because I love Jesus, and that's all that mattered. And, in fact, I thought that people probably did better with someone of my lack of abilities than someone that was really good they couldn't keep up with. They could easily go keep up with me and surpass me. I thought that would be better for participation. So I am, um, something changed. And the next thing you know, things came on. I could understand scripture. It popped out of me. I could speak about things. I grew in the joy of the Lord. I loved singing praises to the Lord. It just seemed like it was a dream come true. Everything just seemed to come. And the more, more and more young people about my own age came around. We had households at the time, and we formed a community called New Life. And you're seeing the results of this at this particular point in time now. Um, something just changed, and it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And I saw it, and I saw it now that I could say things and people listened. Okay. People could really hear me speak. They could hear that I spoke from my heart. It even carried over into my job. Which they wanted to send me to the Pentagon to speak and to Walter Reed and places like that. And uh, uh, not about Jesus, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, just about environmental engineering. But even that carried through there. And um, something changed. Something happened. And a lot happened as a result of it. And the fruits of the Spirit changed. There's a lot of things that were in my life that had to go. I didn't even realize they had to go, but they did. And God eventually, slowly but surely, convicted me of them. And I was willing to give over uh, my life to Him. Because He became more important. So something really took place with me because of this the Holy Spirit. And I began to understand His power. And that's why here we're doing this. this was, that was like 1974, 1976. All right. 50 years ago, all right, and it's still, still alive and well in me, okay? I want nothing more than to give my life to Jesus and to see everyone enjoy Jesus as well. That's why we're sharing this now, okay? It happened to me, it can happen to you. I was one of those that firmly believed it. Well, I'll be the one of the guys that it won't happen to me. It'll happen to everybody else. It won't happen to me. Well, it happened to me. And so if you're getting that word right now, it can happen to you, all right? It can happen to you, too. So, anyway, that's what our story is about. Something happened to the apostles. They were this way, didn't quite have it, and they changed dramatically, and the church exploded. We were one way, we got empowered, and things happened that changed it to happen, really, really good things happen. There's a lot of you that may have been Catholic all your life, but you never were exposed to this very source of power that is yours completely. You know, when you were baptized, 
when you were baptized, you know what happened to Jesus when he was baptized? God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit fell upon him. When you were baptized, the Holy Spirit fell upon you. Guess what? God probably said, this is my beloved son or daughter, which you were at that point, in whom I am well pleased. And that spirit dwells in you, ready to come out in any given time. You just have to say yes to it, find out how he wants to work in you, and do it. It'll be a different path for all of us. My story won't be your story. Amen. My story isn't uh, Gilbert's story, but you have your story meant to be lived out. There's gifts under that Christmas tree that you've got need to be opened up and used. You don't want to see those things still unwrapped and you face God the Father saying, why, why did you unwrap my present? I got this for you. Okay, I didn't want to use that. No, don't, don't be afraid of that now. Just go ahead and just say, okay, Lord, whatever you want. I want to open up whatever you've got for me. And I'll do it. I'll do it, Lord. Okay, so... That's what takes place. It's still happening now 2,000 years later. How does that happen to you? How does it begin to happen to you? That's the subject of next week's teaching. We'll continue the reading in Acts of the Apostles, see Peter's instruction on how to make this happen for those, those people then. We'll give you the instruction, kind of how it happened to us, how we can begin the door to open up to happen to you. So please be there next week, next um, um, Monday.